Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the second lecture on Heart of Darkness, uh, which we're doing as part of this course on gender and literature. So in the opening lecture on this Joseph Conrad novel, I talked about how uh, I give you a historical background of the cultural conditions of the times which produced this novel, uh, which was published in 1899, first in Blackwood Magazine, London, uh, where Conrad was writing uh, and based. Uh, I talked about, I'll give you a very brief uh, idea of Conrad's biographical uh, details why he came as a Polish immigrant uh, into London and he settled in London and he learned English much later in his life uh, and he only started writing and publishing at the age of 40 uh, so which is a rarity he didn't start early but he wrote an enormous amount of uh, work in the end this author is quite impressive which includes some of the finest novels written in the history of English literature including uh, Out of Darkness, Lord Jim, Secret Agent and many more. Now I give you in the first lecture uh, an idea of how uh, gender in Heart of Darkness uh, doesn't really depend or is not determined by biological you know, entity, by biological body, but it plays out in things like uh, imperialism, ideology, knowledge. So knowledge is deeply gendered in Heart of Darkness. So knowledge is male, knowledge is produced by the male, knowledge is protected by the male, uh, and knowledge is preserved by the male. So that knowledge is something which is denied to the female, uh, as we see in Heart of Darkness. And you know, this is a very interesting novel because it looks at a way in which something as quote unquote universal as knowledge too is deeply gendered, deeply discursive. Right? So knowledge is deeply, deeply discursive. And obviously those of you who read Foucault, Michel Foucault would know what I'm talking about, but he talks about the relationship between knowledge and power. So whoever has knowledge has power in Heart of Darkness. So the powerful men are the men, are the people who sort of protect, produce, protect and preserve knowledge. Uh, a certain kind of knowledge which is uh, concealed, which is held back from the woman. Uh, the women don't, uh, they just, is, you know, they don't feature in anything to do with imperialism, they don't get the benefits of imperialism except as a passive recipient. But more, more, more importantly, more interestingly and more tragically, they also deny the basic ontological knowledge of imperialism. That is not given to them at all. So we talked about in, in the first few lectures where we read something like Chatham Shikilari, uh, and also the opening critical uh, you know, lectures that we did, we talked about the relationship between you know, gender and space, gender and you know, how the same building can be deeply gendered uh, and subdivided into different spaces, etc., which we saw in the Munshi Premchal short story, The Chess Players. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, what Heart of Darkness does is it definitely it, it plays it up, the entire idea of space and gender. It, it magnifies it. Uh, at a much bigger level, uh, whereby Congo becomes this exotic female space uh, to be conquered by the very phallic uh, European men, uh, and, and London becomes this very male uh, capitalist space with erect buildings uh, and commercial offices, uh, which becomes obviously the headquarter of imperialism, the white city. So the white city and the dark space, they play out against each other as metaphors of male Western uh, enlightenment uh, civilization as opposed to a female, atavistic, uh, you know, mysterious, exotic, uh, you know, darkness. Uh, and that's how these two things play out against each other. But more importantly, uh, and this is something we, we notice at the immediate level, but more importantly at a more uh, micro level, what we see in Heart of Darkness is like I said, the level in which knowledge is produced and protected and how knowledge is deeply gendered, how knowledge is denied to a certain gender, how knowledge is protected and manipulated by the men, by the male who obviously constitute the imperialist, uh, how knowledge is manipulatable, uh, and, uh, how knowledge is not something which is universal, which is sort of ontologically universal and unchangeable, but it's deeply discursive, mutable and plastic. And this is something Heart of Darkness does. And in a very interesting sense, uh, what Heart of Darkness also does is it, 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 it shows a very slippery relationship, the very slippery relationship between the sign and the meaning. 
right? So, uh, and in that sense, it's quite post-structuralist. It, it's a novel which anticipates, to a certain extent, post-structuralism, entire breakdown between the signifier and the signified. Uh, that's something you'll know uh, if you're doing a critical theory course. What is post-structuralism, etc. Now, what what how the darkness does at a stylistic level? We talked about the thematic, con the, the content and how the darkness, the themes and how the darkness. But it's also important when you read someone like Joseph Conrad to look at the style uh, in which he's writing. Now, he seems to anticipate, in a very interesting sense, he seems to anticipate the later modernist experiments with language. You know? So, things like stream of consciousness, uh, fragmented narration, unreliable narration, uh, flashback narration, uh, flashback narrative strategies, uh, things which abound in the works of the high modernists, such as Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, and before that, Moses Proust. Uh, these are the themes which seem to be anticipated in, in Conrad's early works, uh, not least in Heart of Darkness. Now, uh, Heart of Darkness, in a very interesting sense, it, it marks a departure from the classic realist tradition of novel writing. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it is a very radical novel. Uh, it, it shows the entire failure of the classic realistic narration. It shows the, the collapse of the classic realist narration. How the classic realist narration as a strategy does not work. Uh, in terms of telling the story of what happened in the Congo. So, if, if the classic realist narration is a European construct, is a European ontological epistemological construct, it is something which is designed by the European at the level of knowledge. Now, it will work finally, it will work magnificently inside the European context, but if we are to tell a story of something which happened outside of Europe, then classic realist narration would fail as a narrative strategy as a narrative maneuver. And the entire novel, Heart of Darkness, can be seen, can be read uh, as, a, a, as a fail, as an anti-novel, as an unsuccessful attempt at storytelling. So, it is a magnificently successful novel about an unsuccessful storytelling. So, there's a, I told you, I talked about the paradox in the previous lecture, the opening lecture of Heart of Darkness. Now, so just to come back to the point of knowledge. So, knowledge uh, in the time of imperialism uh, was something which is, like I said, manipulatable. It was deeply manipulatable and one of the things which imperialism did uh, in order to succeed as an ethos, uh, you know, because you know, it can't just uh, stay at the level of military invasion. It has to become some kind of an epistemic invasion. It has to be an invasion at the level of knowledge as well. It has to produce not just its army, but also its own unique knowledge of right and wrong, true and false, etc. At that level, imperialism worked magnificently in, in, as a strategy in which certain local narratives were passed off as universals and unquestionable universals. So, the local narrative of the superiority of the white race, for instance, which is something which is locally produced, something which is obviously a part of the white male fantasy. Now, how does white male fantasy transformed into objective ontological knowledge? And this entire transition from a local fantasy into a global knowledge is something which imperialism succeeded in doing magnificently. Right? So, the entire idea of taking up a little local fantasy of supremacy of superiority and transform that and convert that into a global knowledge which is unquestionable because it is backed by the philosophy of enlightenment, it is backed by the philosophy of reason and rationality which obviously are very Eurocentric white constructs. So, these are things which heart of darkness uh, you know dramatizes. It dramatizes the entire constructed quality of European enlightenment. It dramatizes the entire constructed quality of reason, of logic, of knowledge, the very deeply Eurocentric embeddedness of these categories which we otherwise consider and receive and consume as universals. In other words, Heart of Darkness despite its brevity, despite its very, very, uh, you know, it is like a 90 page novel really, it is not really a novel, some people say it is a novella as I mentioned in the previous lecture, but despite its brevity, despite its length, it manages to, uh, you know, really assault the entire ethos of enlightenment, uh, you know, it completely deconstructs and it reveals uh, the entire constructed quality of enlightenment, the constructed quality of truth, the constructed quality of patriarchy, the constructed quality of phallogocentricity. I talked about this term, it is a very loaded term, phallogocentricity. It is a combination of the phallocentric and the logocentric, right? So, it is the logic of the father, the logic of the male. And obviously, we are talking about the white European male when we mention the word male. It is the kind of logic which is used, manipulated, created, uh, fantasized, and obviously then converted into an ontological knowledge by the white, western, wealthy, and powerful men uh, in order to produce, promote and perpetuate 
the idea of supremacy, the idea of superiority. And that superiority at an ideological level was a necessity for imperialism. It was a necessity, it was an absolute imperative uh, in terms of looking at imperialism as some kind of a, uh, you know, a white man's supremacy. Right? Because that would justify to a certain extent ideologically the territorialization of the white man in a non-white space. So, you know, the obvious question is what a white man is doing in a non-white space would be effaced away if we can counter that with an argument that this is a civilizing mission, that this is a knowledge mission. This is why the white man brings the, the superior knowledge and gives it, confers it to the non-white uh, consumer who happily and passively consume it. So, as I mentioned, imperialism worked brilliantly in terms of looking at the, the entanglement between military invasion and epistemic invasion. Right? Uh, invasion on the level of knowledge, invasion on the level of corporeal uh, and physical uh, you know, maneuvers. Now, Heart of Darkness as a novel, it completely, it, like I said, it really attacks and deconstructs, uh, albeit in a fictional frame, the entire constructive quality of European Enlightenment uh, and reveals Enlightenment as the Heart of Darkness. So, the Heart of Darkness in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is not really located in Africa. The heart of darkness in Joseph Conrad's heart of darkness is located right at the heart of civilized white wealthy Europe. And in that sense, it's a shocking novel. That sense, it's a very radical novel. It's a novel which completely inverts the idea of civilization, civilized and non civilized. It completely inverts the idea of logical and illogical, of rational and irrational, etc. But mind you, and this is a very important caveat, that Joseph Conrad is writing as an insider. So it's a bit uh, it's a bit risky to look at Conrad as an out and out radical, as someone who is completely critiquing imperialism. He's not. He's very much nostalgically looking at imperialism as a failing mission, and this is important. He's looking at imperialism as a system which is failing, and he's almost mourning the failure of imperialism. He's not celebrating it. He's not someone who's saying that imperialism is an out and out evil thing and it must be brought to an end, it must be stopped, it must be revealed. Uh, he's someone who uh, is basically, uh, you know, mournfully looking at imperialism as a dying enterprise, as an enterprise which is, you know, revealing its constructed monstrous qualities. In other words, he is someone, you know, the, the voice of Conrad in Heart of Darkness, as in other novels about imperialism, is, about, is a someone who would very much have loved the idea of imperialism as a grand, noble, civilizing enterprise, but now knows too well, now knows that it is not a grand, noble and civilized enterprise and now he is basically reporting the death of imperialism, he is reporting the, the, the monstrosity of imperialism, the constructive quality of imperialism, not as someone who is celebrating it, but as someone who is basically mourning his death and this is an important distinction to make. So, he is not one of us, one of your postmodern novelists who is celebrating centerlessness. He is not. He is basically lamenting the loss of the center. He is someone who is mourning the loss of the center. And in that sense, uh, he is a conservative. In, 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 a, in a very logical, literal sense, he is a conservative. He is someone who very much wishes the center had hold. Uh, the center had held together its different components uh, and uh, you know that entire noble white enterprise imperialism had worked, but it is not working and he is being an honest journalist, an honest reporter of his times. So, in that sense, Heart of Darkness is a very disturbing novel. It is a radical novel, but not as not radical in the sense of being a postmodern celebration of centerlessness. It is not that kind of radicalism we are talking about. It is a radical novel given the, the context of his times in which he is basically mourning the death of imperialism as a grand noble enterprise and basically telling us that there was no such thing as a grand noble enterprise of imperialism. It is always a nakedly exploitative enterprise and that is a long and short of Heart of Darkness. The entire male fantasy, the entire white male project, the entire white male fantasy of superiority which fueled the ideology of imperialism is all revealed to be evil, is all revealed to be darkness. So, the darkness in Heart of Darkness is not the geographical darkness that we normally and very racially associate with the African darkness. The darkness is very much at the heart of European enlightenment, which produces something like imperialism, which produces something like the exploitation of imperialism that Marlowe, the narrator of Heart of Darkness, is only too aware of right now. Okay? So, this is a very important point that I want you to understand, I want you to pay some attention to how knowledge in Heart of Darkness is revealed as a construct, 
our knowledge in the heart of darkness is revealed as an entity which can be manipulated, which can be changed, which is mutable, which is something which is not universal, which is something which is not uh, unchangeable, is not something which is grand. In other words, knowledge in the heart of darkness is not a grand narrative. Knowledge in Heart of Darkness is a local narrative, a series of local narratives which want to pass off as a grand narrative but fails. Right? So, imperialism in Heart of Darkness is a failing mission, it is something which is you know everyone is seeing it as what it really is. It is not a civilizing mission at all, it is an exploitative mission and once you know it is an exploitative mission, you are guilty of it. So, in a sense Heart of Darkness is about the white man's guilt and in that sense it is very interestingly connected. Uh, and can be connected to uh, you know George Orwell's essay on shooting an elephant, where again it's about the white man's guilt. Uh, it's about uh, being the white man in a colonial space and you know understanding how the entire machinery of imperialism works uh, as a grand male fantasy, a white male fantasy, uh, which wants to convert itself into some kind of a universal logic of superiority of supremacy, but actually not. <coughs> but actually, it is not. You know? So, the, in that sense there is that cynicism in Heart of Darkness, there is a departure in Heart of Darkness from the grand narrative of imperialism as a civilizing mission. Okay? So, this is basically a very interesting idea which I want you to pay some attention to and you know you can expect uh, you know questions on it, you can expect you know this, these, these are topics you can take home uh, and explore further and possibly study more if you really want to do a serious study of Heart of Darkness, not just Heart of Darkness, but as you know of any colonial and post colonial novels, uh, you know how is knowledge uh, featuring in these novels, uh, how does knowledge play out uh, in these narratives uh, as a category, as a state of being etcetera. Now, in my opening lecture of Heart of Darkness, I talked about how uh, you know the woman in Heart of Darkness, they either petrifying presence or they are passive presence. Right, so either they petrify the men, they have this uh, castrating gaze, uh, and the woman in the Belgian office, the, the office in, in Brussels that Mother goes to, the woman look at him uh, as if they're, to, they're sort of freezing his masculinity, they're freezing him completely, and he feels castrated and claustrophobic uh, under their gaze. Uh, or the woman in Heart of Darkness uh, are, are very passive and romantic and naively consuming any knowledge that the men give them. Right, so Kurtz was intended. Kurtz's fiance, the white woman that Kurtz was supposed to marry, uh, you know, when he came back from the colonies, which he never did. But the, the Belgian woman in Brussels, uh, you know, is very much a romantic mourner. She's mourning the death of Kurtz. She's looking at Kurtz. Uh, you know, she imagines Kurtz as his grand white adventure hero. You know, this is at another point that I want to touch upon a little bit uh, in Heart of Darkness. Heart of Darkness is a very interesting gender text, it is a very important text about gender and literature and it sort of deconstructs uh, the stereotypical understanding of gender because it takes the form of adventure narrative right and this is interesting please stay with me here. It takes the form of adventure narrative in the same tradition as the narratives of Ryder Haggard or even Rudyard Kipling uh, for that matter, but then it problematizes it. Right? So, the form which is the adventure story in Heart of Darkness, then it becomes an anti-adventure tale. So, there is no adventure at all in Heart of Darkness. So, you know it starts off in an exotic setting, it is about a sailor storyteller uh, who is sitting in a little boat in Thames uh, telling you know his white audience what happened in the Congo and you all set, you all expecting a very exotic adventure story right. Uh, you know there are you know wild animals, there are bees. Uh, the human beings who are bees, obviously they are Africans, so they are all bees and it is about the white man controlling them, uh, rescuing them etcetera. So, you were sort of expecting that kind of a narrative which was being written at that point of time. So, there was a series of uh, extremely sexist racist novels which have been written at that point of time uh, you know and so, Conrad seems to sort of take a leave from that uh, in terms of uh, the form. So, he very much borrows the form in that sense, but what it does with the form is very interesting. It, it makes a departure from the form you know he deviates from the form and it makes it into an anti-adventure story. So, Heart of Darkness is not about male glory, Heart of Darkness is not about masculinous adventure, it is just the opposite. Heart of Darkness is about the deconstruction of masculinity, it is about the deconstruction of imperial masculinity. So, Kutz in Heart of Darkness is the epitome of imperial masculinity. So, he is someone who is trained by Europe, who is someone and there is a, a lovely line in Heart of Darkness which says that the entire Europe went into the making of Kutz, 
right? So he is literally constructed by the ethos of enlightenment, logic, rationality, the entire Eurocentric knowledge system which produces him. Now that, that production which is Kurtz, that construction which is Kurtz, now is completely deconstructed uh, at, at, in, in Congo, in Africa and he becomes a rogue agent as I mentioned in my previous lecture. So he is someone who is constructed and then deconstructed in how to do this. So in other words, what Conrad's novel shows us interestingly is that even someone like Kurtz, even someone so uh, quote unquote perfect like Kurtz, someone who is perfectly controlled, created by Europe as Kurtz, even that entity, even that individual can crack up, even that individual can be deconstructed, even that individual can go against the system which had historically produced it. Right? And if that happens, then obviously, uh, this is obviously at a micro level, but if that happens on a micro level, which that, which, what that basically means, what that basically reflects is that the entire machinery of enlightenment, the entire ethos of enlightenment and logic and rationality and Eurocentricity, that can be open for deconstruction. Right? So goods, the individual goods, the individual breaking up of goods, the individual cracking up of goods is reflective of the possibility of the entire idea of enlightenment cracking up. And that becomes a very dark vision and that is the heart of darkness and I keep saying this, I keep repeating myself but this is exactly what I want to emphasize. That is the heart of darkness in Conrad's novel. The possibility that the entire enlightenment, the entire European logic system, rational system, you know, the, the phallogocentric system, the possibility that all this can be deconstructed, can be completely collapsed. You know, that possibility, the knowledge of nothingness, the knowledge of this possibility constitutes the heart of darkness in Joseph Conrad's novel, right? And as I mentioned uh, in the previous lecture and I say it again, the entire knowledge system in Heart of Darkness is basically a white male fantasy. And in that fantasy, the white woman as well as a non-white man and a non-white woman who is doubly marginalized, they are all equally imprisoned, they are equally, uh, they are consumed in that order of knowledge. So they are basically, uh, you know, they become this very passive consumers uh, of this kind of knowledge of supremacy of the white man. So no one questions it. So uh, if you take the example of Kurtz's intended, uh, who is a very interesting character in the novel, he just appears. In, she just appears in the end. The, the fiance, the Belgian white fiance of Kurtz, uh, who Marlowe goes to in, in order to talk about Kurtz. So, so it's a very romantic scene. Uh, it's almost like what we see in war movies: uh, a dead soldier's wife mourning uh, the death of a hero, or a husband hero, or a fiance hero, or a lover hero, and another soldier, uh, this brotherly comrade of the dead man going and telling the wife of the dead man what a heroic person uh, her husband was. That is the setting. So again, you look at the setting, if you look at the form, the form is very stereotypically sexist, racist and all of that. But what we see is how Conrad problematizes the form, right? How he converts this form into some kind of a counter narrative. So we find Marlowe extremely neurotic. Uh, in, the, in the compulsion to lie to Kurtz as intended. He knows he has to lie to Kurtz as intended. This is, you know, he, there's no other way out. So in a very interesting sense, we can look at this entire scene as a loss of agency for the man as well as for the woman. So the very literal reading it would be to look at the woman as someone who's denied knowledge, someone who never gets to know what really happened uh, in Congo. So uh, you know the, the scene of the novel is Marlowe's, uh, Kurtz, Kurtz's intended asks Marlowe uh, in a very romantic hushed tone, uh, just say, just tell me what were his dying words. You know, th those of us who read the novel would know that the dying words of Kurtz were the horror, the horror. These are the words he dies with, right, literally. So the horror obviously is a knowledge uh, of the hollowness of imperialism, of the hollowness of enlightenment, the monstrosity of enlightenment, the monstrosity of phallogocentric logic. That is the knowledge with which Kurtz dies with and that knowledge uh, produces this response, evokes this response of the horror, the horror, right? Now obviously Marlowe does not tell this to Kurtz's intended. So Kurtz's intended, this white woman who is very much located inside the white space, someone who's never been outside the white space, someone who is an insider into the white space. So she is someone who must be misinformed. She is someone who must be lied to in order for the male fantasy of imperialism to continue. 
right? Now, Malo is very, very cynical. Malo, when he lies to Kunz's intended, does it very, very cynically. And he's very neurotic. And you know, the, the entire narration, when he's telling the other people about the entire episode, when he went to see Kunz's intended uh, to report about him and how he was forced to lie. Uh, to the Mona, that made him even more neurotic, that made him even more cynical about the situation, about his situatedness uh, in this entire machinery of imperialism. But the point is, the point I'm trying to tell you is that even the man, even the male imperial agent does not have any way out. Even the male imperial agent is equally agencyless. So there, is, there seems to be this overarching phallogocentric patriarchal profit principle which will deny the biological woman as well as the biological man any liberty or any agency to act out his or her will. Right? So there is overarching narrative of imperialism. That overarching narrative is very patriarchal. The overarching narrative is that of racist supremacy. The overarching narrative is that of white supremacy. Right? And that overarching narrative denies any human intervention. Now, obviously, you must be thinking and you should be thinking about what happened in uh, George Orwell's Shooting the Elephant. This is exactly the same thing. Right? The overarching narrative in Orwell's Shooting the Elephant was that, that a white man must be a hero, whether he wants it or not. Now, that narrative has already preset, pre established. It's a very coded narrative. Now, the biological white man, the individual white man, may not want to be the hero. But that choice, that intervention is denied to him, right? So the biological white man must be performative, right? So gender over here is performative and it's a performance which is racially, culturally, politically, militarily mediated. So likewise, in Hollow Darkness, when Malo comes back from Congo and goes to see Kursa's intended, uh, he must lie to Kursa's intended. So the man as well as the woman over here, they both suffer the lack of the loss of agency away under the overarching narrative of imperialism. So Marlowe, the agent of imperialism, now has become a cynical hollow man because he's seen imperialism from too close and now he has no other choice apart from becoming cynical. So he must now come back and misinform the Mona, misinform the female Mona, someone who's mourning for the loss of a hero, supposed hero. Right? Now, Marlowe must never tell Kurtz's intended that Kurtz had a mistress in Africa. Marlowe must never tell uh, Kurtz's intended that Kurtz had an African lover. So these are information, uh, these knowledge does not exist. So again, if you look at the way how knowledge is manipulated and manipulatable, and it's manipulatable by the men, it's completely controlled by the men. Right? But at the same time, it, you know, because it's, it's already established, that narrative of manipulation is already established, the individual male cannot intervene over here. Right? So that entire manipulatable knowledge becomes a male uh, construct. So the individual man cannot intervene. The individual man cannot you know, get out of that narrative. He's very much a part of the narrative and he must perform his role inside that narrative. So this is exactly what happens in Shooting the Elephant, which is the second text which we did just previously, just before this particular text. You know, again, the man George Orwell cannot humanly intervene into the narrative of the white colonial officer set in colonial Burma. The Burmese expect him to behave in a particular way. The narrative of imperialism expects him to behave in a particular way. So he as a human subject, he as a human individual cannot do anything to intervene and change the narrative at any level whatsoever. And this is exactly what happens in Heart of Darkness as well. So when there's that very, that very potent, very pregnant episode where Malo comes back and Kurtz is intended, uh, again, she's performatively a female. She's performatively the female mourner. So she is someone who is mourning the, the death of a heroic husband. Right? And of course, as we know, her husband was far from heroic, her husband was a rogue agent, her husband was cynical, her husband became a torturer, her husband became a bit of a you know, lord in that kind of a setting and he became a god, he became a cruel sadist uh, to a great extent, he's anything but a hero. But in her imagination, her husband must remain a hero. Right? So she too is performatively the female Mona. Right? So in that kind of a performative narrative, Marlow must also become performative. He must come back and performatively tell the romantic report, give the romantic report to the performative mourner. So again, look at the way how gender over here becomes deeply entrenched in performativity. Right? And this very coded performance that Marlow does along with Kutz's intent. Both are lying to each other, both are play acting with each other. And again, she is a performative female, he is a performative imperial male. 
and any biological intervention is impossible over here. Right? And that's the point I keep telling you uh, in the course, uh, and as you move on in this particular course, this entire opposition between biological human will and the uh, grand uh, performative will, which you know, fuels or informs the gender narratives in the different texts that we study as part of this course. Now, uh, the other woman, of course, in Heart of Darkness is the other woman. Uh, the African woman, uh, the woman who doesn't have a name, but of course the white woman too doesn't have a name. So in that sense, they are quite similar to each other. They're both agency less. Uh, obviously, the white woman is more comfortable. Uh, she has a more romantic setting, whereas the uh, the, the African mistress of goods uh, is described in very physical, animalistic metaphors as if she's some kind of a lusty animal who had consumed goods. Uh, and obviously, Kurtz is someone uh, who seemed to have been consumed by this exotic female. So, even the perfect male construct of enlightenment had been consumed and converted by the exotic African female, who uh, becomes almost like a predator presence uh, in that particular novel. Now, she doesn't have a name, she doesn't have a voice, but she, does ha she just has a shriek. So, Marlowe describes this cry of Kurtz's African mistress as she looks out, right. And uh, you know that cry obviously uh, is a cry uh, which is very loaded. We can look at it from a post post colonial perspective. This is the subaltern scream in a certain sense, but I think it's more interesting. It's more loaded than that. That cry uh, a obviously is a voicelessness of the marginalized, and also equally that cry is the inscrutability of the non-European logic system from the point of view of the European. So the European logical man cannot understand that cry. The European logical man will always fail to understand that cry, because this is where the European logic ends and breaks. And that is another point that I want to emphasize about Heart of Darkness. This is a novel that also looks at the local quality of logic. I right? will say that again, it looks at the local quality of logic. So, logic which is something which uh, you know, we assume, we consume it to be a grand given. Now, that grand givenness of logic is revealed to be a construct. It is a local uh, construct which obviously masquerades uh, as a grand narrative of universal system of knowledge, logic, Eurocentric enlightenment logic. Now, that enlightenment Eurocentric logic fails in a non-European space, in a non-Eurocentric space and this is exactly what Heart of Darkness dramatizes to a great extent. And again, I come back to a point I am repeating over and over again. The darkness in Heart of Darkness is a failure of this logic. It is a revelation that this not logic system is actually a construct. It is a local construct. It will not work in all spaces. It will not work if you take it away from its context. It will not work if you take it away from the, 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 the conditions which had historically produced it. Right? It's not a, it's not a universal given. Right? It is not a grand given. It is something which is locally produced and it is locally tied to that kind of a setting. Right? So, this is the revelation, this is the knowledge that Heart of Darkness dramatizes. The knowledge of nothingness, the knowledge of limitation, the knowledge of the constructed quality of knowledge. Right? So, in that sense it is quite you know it is got a meta cognitive quality uh, to it. It is a knowledge about the uh, constructed quality of knowledge that Heart of Darkness dramatizes and that is what makes it so cynical, uh, such a dark novel. It is a novel about despair, it is a novel about cynicism, it is a novel about dissolution etcetera. Right? And obviously, the entire dissolution, the despair is this white male despair. Right? The white male supremacy uh, is revealed to be a fantasy, is revealed to be a myth, is revealed to be uh, a quote unquote illogical system, it is far from logical, it is an illogical system, it is not something which is really happening, it is not something which is really a given, it is something which is basically a local myth. And you know, we have different consumers of this myth, uh, the consumers are men, the consumers are women etcetera. So, that, that, that African black mistress of goods who is very, very uh, racially described and the entire description is through her body. The entire description is, I mean we did never get to know, we never get to see uh, the beautiful emotional quality of the African woman uh, in, in contrast to this beautiful mourning emotion that Kurtz's uh, intended exhibits. So, Kurtz's intended is all emotions. We never get to see, we never get to know uh, her physical nature, we never get to know any mundane quality about her. So, she is just all elegant emotions, right. And that elegance and emotionality is obviously uh, you know, locating her, situating her in this sort of civilized construct, 
and she's a white Western woman. And so naturally, she's elegant, and she's all emotion, and she's on appetitive. She's on all body. Now, in complete contrast to that, we have Kutz's African mistress, who is just all body. And again, this entire binary of the mind and the body, of the mind being this sort of soft, noble, elegant uh, entity, and the body being this appetitive, uh, you know, sort of consuming, uh, low entity, is something which comes back, something which is drawn from the entire legacy of enlightenment, and especially the Cartesian idea of enlightenment, which uh, and completely located the humanness of the human being to the mind. You know, this very famous Cartesian uh, line, I think, therefore I am. So, your entire uh, you know, sense of self is produced out of your ability to think. Uh, so, the entire sense of self is located in the mind, and the body has got nothing to do with it. So, this is a very European construct. A very European divide, a very European binary, uh, which informs directly the logic of uh, imperialism and enlightenment, where the mind becomes European and the body becomes African. The mind becomes uh, male and the body becomes female. And again, it connects it back to a point which I have been talking about, uh, had talked about in the previous lecture, how, in a very interesting sense, the African and the woman, they are tied together, they are connected together in a way the European male looks at them, right, as sort of anti logic. Uh, so, the, 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 the white woman is hysterical, the white woman is irrational, the white woman is illogical, the white woman is all that which is anti-rational. Right? Uh, likewise, obviously, uh, the, the African, whether it's white, male or female, is all uh, body, is all appetite, is all anarchy, is all, uh, you know, you know uh, uncivilized. So, you know, civilization and body, uh, you know, logic and, uh, you know, the body, is uh, the, the contrast with each other. Okay? So, the very description of the novel will reveal to you very clearly that the white woman is all elegant emotion, it's all about emotions and mourning and you know, very metaphoric way of looking at life, very philosophic, very deep, very noble, whereas the African intended, the African mistress of goods is, and again look at the word, the, the description, the difference between the words, intended and mistress. So, intended is a polite, noble, civilized, sophisticated word, it's a fiancé. As someone is supposed to marry again. Uh, the very uh, idea of marriage uh, and you know someone who is intending to marry is part of this patriarchal, uh, heteronormative economic system which fueled imperialism. Whereas in complete contrast to that, we have the idea of the mistress, the exotic sexual other, who you're never going to marry uh, and who's never going to fit into the entire Eurocentric heteronormative idea of family, kinship, and economy. So again, the, the, the very words, the very adjectives, the very nouns in Heart of Darkness are very loaded ontological opposites to each other and they play against each other in terms of looking at the European and the non-European, the civilized and the uncivilized, the male and the female. Okay? So just to come back uh, and so continue with this point and I will sort of start winding up very soon, uh, Kutz's intended and Kutz's mistress. Uh, are not just racially opposite to each other, they are both biologically female, but they are racially opposite to each other, but also they are opposites to each other level of knowledge. Right? So, the knowledge that Kutz's mistress has is completely different from the knowledge that Kutz's mistress has. So, Kutz's mistress actually saw Kutz uh, as what he really was uh, in Africa, in Congo, whereas Kutz's intended will never get to know and will probably never want to know what Kutz had actually become. She is very happy to consume the romantic report about Kutz that he, he, he did and, and obviously the report that Marlow gives up is that he died with your name on his lips and that is so romantic, right? You know, the, the heroic man dies with the word, the last word of the heroic man as he dies is a name of his beloved intended. I mean, you can't get more romantic than that. A sort of syrupy romanticism, but it is exactly the romanticism which is consumed by the uh, white female inside the European metropolis. Someone who has never been outside, someone will never get to know, someone will never see what really happens in the European, uh, in, in the imperial colonial space. Someone will never get to know the dirty job of imperialism, uh, something which uh, the historical George Orwell saw and something which the fictional Marlowe sees in Heart of Darkness. Someone who is very, very neatly kept outside, very elegant, she's a very elegant outsider in the entire machinery of imperialism. Someone who believes that imperialism is a grand, noble, romantic enterprise. So, Kutz to her, Kutz to Kutz's intended is a romantic hero, right? Because he dies, uh, he goes on a civilized mission and he dies with the name of the beloved on his lips. 
But in complete opposite to that, we have Kurtz's African mistress, who actually sees Kurtz what he really is in the end, as a status torturer of who becomes a lord uh, in some kind of a system, some kind of a kinship system which he presides over. So much so that it had become historically a problem to imperialism. He became so much, uh, you know, he, he was sort of, he, he extended the entire profit principle of imperialism to such an extent that it became a problem to imperialism. So, uh, Slavoj Žižek talks about this very interestingly when he compares, and as you know, there's a famous movie based on Heart of Darkness, it's called Apocalypse Now, which has a Vietnam War as a setting, and Marlon Brando plays the role of Colonel Kutz. Those of you who have seen it will know it's a really good film. Those who haven't seen it, uh, I do recommend it quite highly. So, if you watch the film Apocalypse Now, where Marlon Brando plays Colonel Kutz, the problem with Brando, the pro problem with Kutz is that he has become too much of an imperialist. He has become too much of a naked imperialist. Now, this, this, this loose romantic association of imperialism must be uh, sort of, you know, retained in order for imperialism to pass off as a quasi civilizing mission. Now, if you reveal yourself as a naked, brutal imperialist, then obviously you are saying the entire idea of imperialism is naked and brutal. You are revealing imperialism as it, what, what, what it really is. Now, imperialism must disguise itself as some kind of a soft enterprise, a soft civilizing enterprise. Now, Kurtz's mistress in Africa, in Congo, had actually seen him become this naked imperialist. So, in a very interesting sense, she has a superior knowledge compared to the white woman who is misinformed, who doesn't know, who has no clue whatsoever about what Kurtz really is. She thinks Kurtz is a romantic hero. Right? And she is very happy to consume that knowledge. Right? And again, look at the way how knowledge is manipulated over here. Whereas Kurtz's African mistress knows what Kurtz really is. But of course, she will never say it. All she can do is scream. And that scream becomes a violent articulation in the ears of the European interlocutor, right? Marlow. Marlow, the listener to Kurtz's mistress's scream, uh, will never understand what the scream meant will never understand what the look of Kurtz's intended uh, mistress uh, looking at Congo meant because they never understand it because the tool he uses, the apparatus he uses is a European Eurocentric logic which will fail, which will collapse in Africa, which will collapse outside the European Enlightenment space. Okay? So again, just to wind up this particular lecture, we talk about how uh, you know, Heart of Darkness uh, plays these binaries against each other, the civilized European against the uncivilized African, uh, you know, the white woman against the black woman, but also it becomes more problematic because knowledge itself becomes uh, deeply uh, and racially divided in Heart of Darkness. But paradoxically, the true knowledge about Kurds is given to the, I mean, the, the African woman has access to the true knowledge of Kurds. Whereas the white European woman must be misinformed about Kurds and she becomes a very happy and passive consumer of this misinformation, right, about this myth, right. And this brings us again to the point we started off with in Heart of Darkness, how imperialism uh, sort of relied on this myth of supremacy, the myth of superiority, the fantasy of superiority, which it converted into knowledge, which it converted into objective truth. So, Heart of Darkness is a revelation of the fact that the objective truth of supremacy and superiority of European civilization is, at the end of the day, a myth. Right? It's a local myth, it's a local fantasy, which is, so it tries to pass off as a truth. It tries to masquerade as some kind of a, a logically objective system, which is unquestionable. Right? But actually, it's not. And this is, this is where exactly the political uh, currency of Heart of Darkness lies, especially given today, the world we live in today. It's a really potent political novel, despite the fact that it's written over oh, 100 years ago now, 150 years, so in, like you know, 1899, so you can imagine uh, you know, how much uh, you know, time has passed you know, in terms of from the point where Heart of Darkness was written. But again, uh, some of the basic ontological uh, structural similarities remain today. You know, the supremacy of the white man, the supremacy of the white civilization, and the fear of the other. That's something which we are encountering uh, you know, almost every single day as we read the political headlines uh, across the world, uh, in India, locally, globally. The fear of the other, and how to tame the other, how to sort of uh, castrate the other, how to invade the other before the other invades you. So, uh, sort of looking at the other as some kind of a contaminating presence, looking at the other as some kind of a threat 
to your national security, to your hygienic security, to your cultural security, and you know, doing your best to uh, you know, put the other at bay. And if you look at things like immigration policies today, uh, things like you know, xenophobia today, racism today, uh, you find how the fear of the other is uh, so much an internalized idea. It's so much an internalized condition. It's almost normal now. It's not something which you are uh, ashamed to be. It's not something which, you're, uh, you know, which you have to think twice in order to enact. It's so much a part of the normal coded ritual of the daily discourses of life which we follow as, as citizens uh, of nations across the world. So Heart of Darkness in that sense is an extremely politically significant novel given the times in which we dwell in today. Right? So in the uh, subsequent lecture, we'll have one more lecture on Heart of Darkness where I look at certain specific sections in the novel. We'll look at certain specific passages in the novel. But you know, these two lectures, this lecture and the one previously, uh, immediately before this, uh, will I know, have hopefully given you an idea of how gender in Heart of Darkness is a deeply problematic construct. It's performative, it's problematic, uh, it's racially mediated, uh, it's uh, you know, territorially mediated, uh, gender and territorialization, they are very, very complexly connected in Heart of Darkness and how gender and truth, how gender and knowledge uh, play against each other uh, you know, in terms of certain dramatic situations which Conrad's novel you know, situates so uh, brilliantly. Right? So it's a very, very, uh, like I say, it's got a lot of ontological and political density uh, which, which makes it such a difficult novel to read. So it, it takes you such a lot of time to read Heart of Darkness, to go through it entirely, despite the fact it's just a 90 page novel. Right? So in the next lecture, which we'll have on Heart of Darkness, we'll look at certain sections from the play, uh, from, the, from the novel, I beg your pardon, where uh, certain, you know, some of the ideas we've been talking about in the last two lectures uh, are played out and dramatized uh, in a very graphic way. Right? So we'll, we'll, we'll see those episodes as we do it in the next lecture. But for now, I just want you to dwell on these ideas that I leave you with. Uh, the relationship between gender and space, the relationship between gender and knowledge, the relationship between gender and narration. Right? How certain narrative strategies are deeply gendered. The classic realist narration is a very phallogocentric way to narrate. Right? And I'll talk about that in more details in the next lecture. But I'll just leave you with this today, that the classic realist narration where the omniscient narrator knows everything, is everywhere, uh, knows exactly what's going to happen in the future, knows exactly what happened in the past. This omniscient, all-progressive, all-knowing narration is the phallogocentric fantasy. This phallogocentric fantasy collapses completely in Heart of Darkness. And in its place, we have an unreliable narration. We have an unreliable narrator. We have a neurotic narrator, someone who doesn't know how to narrate. So the entire novel becomes a failed narration uh, about what happened in a space outside of Europe. So even the level of narration, gender comes in very, very complexly in Heart of Darkness. So I leave it uh, over here. I leave you with this idea as a dwell on. And the next lecture, which will have Heart of Darkness, the final lecture on this particular novel, we'll look at certain selected passages, which we'll study in some details in order to basically, you know, flesh out some of the ideas we have covered in the last two lectures. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you again in the next lecture on Heart of Darkness. Thank you.